First of all, I guess I should note that this is going to be webcast, so uh, if you have any problems with that, hopefully you don't, but uh, this is going to be webcast and I believe archived by the Wilson Center for people who couldn't attend to see it later. Um, by way of introduction, my name is Robert Wampler. I'm a senior fellow at the National Security Archive. Some of you may be familiar with that uh, institution. We are located just across town at George Washington University, where I've been directing a project on U.S.-Korea relations for about 10 years now. Uh, First of all, on behalf of myself, my colleagues here in the National Security Archive, I would like to thank James Person, who can't be here today, and the North Korea International Documentation Project, as well as Christian Osterman and the Cold War International History Project for so generously agreeing to sponsor this event. Um, we're very grateful for your hospitality, and I really cannot think of a better forum for this type of discussion. Uh, finally, uh, not finally, but next, I'd like to thank Chuck Krauss, of the History and Public Policy Program for his invaluable help in organizing the panel throughout the past month or two. And finally, I would like to thank Tom Blanton, Executive Director of the National Security Archive, Sue Bechtel, who some of you met out in the hall, and Chuck again for their help in organizing the reception that will follow this panel discussion. Um, briefly, I'll introduce the panelists here. Directly to my left is Professor William Stook, Emeritus now? Not yet. Not yet. <laughs> University <laughs> of Georgia. Uh, to his left is uh, Dr. Michael Chinworth, who's a senior visiting fellow at the U.S. Japan Center for Studies and Cooperation at Vanderbilt University. Directly to my right is Professor Greg Brzezinski at George Washington University. To his right is Jung Young Kim, who's a lecturer at the University of Sheffield. And then we are very honored to have Professor Sang Ying Ma from Catholic University of Korea, who is currently a public policy scholar here at the Wilson Center, who will be providing commentary on the presentations. I'd also like to note briefly the contributors to the volume who could not make it here today, Professor Yasuyo Sakata at Conde University, Sergei Vachenko, a lecturer at the University of Nottingham in Ningbo, China, and Professor Tai Yung Yung, Yongnam University, South Korea, and Professor Narushike Machishita, who's a National Graduate Institute for Policy Studies in Tokyo. Uh, essentially, each presenter is going to have about 10 minutes to discuss the main points in their chapter, because we have rather limited time here, and we want to leave as much time as possible for discussion, after which Professor Ma will provide his commentary. Following that, we will have a Q&A session, which hopefully will be uh, allow you to probe a little more deeply beyond the 10 points that people are trying to make in their 10 minutes. So I would like to turn it over now to Bill and let him get things started. Okay, thank you. Um, I am going to talk a little bit about both my chapter in this, this book uh, and a chapter in another book, which I have about 20 copies of to distribute to anyone who, who wants them, that is uh, also focused more broadly on the U.S. Uh, Rock Alliance. Um, I want to deal broadly with, with four questions here, which I touch on in both of the articles. Number one, uh, why was the alliance formed? Number two, uh, why has the alliance endured? Uh, number three, uh, what issues have endangered the alliance? And four, what are the prospects for the alliance, at least for the medium term? And both of these, these pieces, and they're published virtually simultaneously, um, there is a bit of a, a, a story behind them in the sense that, that they were, were conceived um, at a time when a couple of things were bothering me about the literature. Uh, one was to, 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 um, to borrow a phrase from Spiro Agnew, uh, it was a time when the nattering nabobs of negativity or negativism uh, were rather prevalent regarding uh, the alliance. That is, in the first decade, or at least for the first seven, eight years of the decade, the alliance uh, seemed to be going through its perhaps most rocky uh, years, uh, and I thought that that the the recent literature was was placing more evidence than really should have been placed on uh, the the troubles in the alliance, uh, even historically, uh, rather than the the levels which I thought were pretty high for the most part uh, of um, of cooperation. And secondly. Um, as an American diplomatic historian uh, who has lived through in the second half of his career the so-called cultural turn, um, I wanted to, to perhaps uh, offer an alternative or at least a qualification 
uh, to the cultural approach uh, to American foreign policy and suggest that when it comes to the U.S.-Rock alliance on balance, the rational actor model uh, of decision making uh, works pretty well, at least in answering the first two questions. That is, why was the alliance formed uh, and why uh, has it endured? Um, in other words, the alliance was formed and has endured because the leading actors on both sides saw it as in their nation's interests. Uh, this despite the fact that there were huge cultural dis differences between uh, the two sides, especially in their uh, initial uh, years. Uh, despite huge personality conflicts uh, between, for example, Ri and just about everybody he dealt with who he didn't dominate, uh, Park Chung-hee and, and, and Jimmy Carter, to some extent Clinton and uh, uh, Kim Young-sam, and certainly uh, Roe Mi Young and the second uh, Bush, despite the strains that the democratization of South Korean politics uh, created uh, in the alliance uh, in, in more recent years. Uh, despite divergent perspectives uh, and, and priorities on the, on the two sides. Now, U.S. rock relations uh, or interests always overlapped, uh, but of course, as in any alliance, they were never uh, identical. Uh, so it was, it was certainly uh, crucial uh, on both sides that there be, there be flexibility, uh, to try and accommodate uh, the other's interests and just as important to adjust to new realities, to changing realities uh, in the international uh, situation. And I argue uh, the, the both, both articles go back really to the late 40s and early 50s um, and, and certainly the, the level of change in the circumstances of the U.S. Rock Alliance uh, if anything, increase from the 1960s onward, with the period from 1980, 1988 to 1992 uh, perhaps the most remarkable period uh, regarding the, 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 the drama of the change or the degree of change with, with the end of the Cold War and the obvious uh, superiority by that time uh, of the Republic of Korea, uh, the opening of relations between the ROC and uh, the Soviet Union, then Russia, and of course uh, with, with China as well. Um, and in, in dealing with, with that particular period, uh, I think one of the things that comes across very strongly is, is how blessed we were to have two statesmen uh, of the, the, the magnitude of George Bush the first uh, and um, no to you, uh, managing the relationship. I think that, that uh, in, in retrospect, uh, they both, you know, we, we, we think of the first Bush as lacking imagination. Uh, but in fact, uh, he, he adapted, I think, very, very nicely uh, to the, the changing circumstances. No to you, I think, we don't think of him necessarily as a military man, as, 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 as being the most imaginative sort, but, but certainly uh, he was quite, quite innovative in his Nord politic and, and yet very savvy in, in never leaving the American relationship behind uh, in the process. Now, despite how well that transition was handled, um, there was an issue that was was emerging in the early 1990s that was bound to create problems uh, down the road, although it didn't really come across uh, with full force until the second Bush uh, got into office, and then, of course, Nomi Yun uh, was elected president in 2002. Um, before the 1990s, the greatest rock fear in the relationship was of abandonment. Um, the greatest American fear was of entrapment. You'll notice here I'm using a, 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 a dichotomy here that political scientists use. Victor Cha has used it very nicely uh, in his book dealing with the trilateral relationship between Japan, South Korea, uh, and the United States. Um, the continued, from the American perspective, the continued presence of American troops uh, was largely an effort to avoid entrapment in another Korean War. Uh, that is, and, and one of the things that uh, is, I think, as far as I know, or original in, in the chapter in this book, 
is the, the revelation that Eisenhower really thought very seriously during the late 50s about eliminating or at least reducing to token levels American forces, ground forces at least, uh, in Korea. And we, we tend to think of this as something that comes up initially uh, with, uh, with Richard Nixon and then hits its, its uh, greatest momentum under Jimmy Carter. But in fact, American decision makers had been actively consider, considering a, a uh, withdrawal of American troops ever since the 1950s. And a key element in the rejection, ultimately, of the total withdrawal of troops had been fear uh, of another, uh, an, another Korean War. Uh, interestingly enough, in the mid-90s, the South Koreans begin to worry about entrapment for the first time in the first nuclear crisis. That is, they, they fear that the United States is going to launch a, a preemptive strike uh, against uh, North Korean nuclear facilities, and this, w this will lead to retaliation that, of course, might lead to the destruction uh, of Seoul. But the, the more long-term problem that emerges in the aftermath of, of uh, at, at the turn of the century is the redefinition by the United States of the, American, of the role of American forces uh, in South Korea. That is, you begin to see this occasionally in documents in the early 90s, but, but especially after 9-11. You see the United States uh, defining the role of American forces as a regional one. And uh, that, of course, creates the possibility of a conflict between the United States and China, most likely over Taiwan, that clearly would not be in the interests uh, of South Korea. So again, the, the, uh, the, the fear of entrapment becomes, I would argue, uh, the, the most serious threat uh, to the alliance because it's a case where on the ra rational actor model, South Korea would have a definite uh, interest that would be contrary to the American uh, and it might be uh, of sufficient moment uh, to actually uh, disrupt the alliance. That, of course, issue comes up uh, at a time when probably the two most ham-handed leaders on the two sides in the history of the relationship happen to be in office. That is Bush II uh, and, and No Mi Yun. So we, we enter into a very rocky period. And yet, even through this period, uh, we see, although there's a lot of rhetoric on both sides that is, is bordering on inflammatory, and certainly there's a lot of criticism in the public domain on both sides, um, the governments are making significant agreements with each other regarding uh, American bases, regarding uh, shifting the bases, the movement out of Yongsan, the, the ROC role, the role of the ROC army in, in wartime and so forth. So that, that actually I would argue that the alliance is perhaps more solid than it appeared to people at the time as they were living through it. Uh, and of course, obviously, uh, since the departure of, of those two leaders, the relationship uh, has become very solid. And even on the issue of the role of American forces, the regional role of American forces, uh, if you look at a, a comment or a joint statement that was made in January of 2006, a joint statement by Condoleezza Rice and Ban Ki-moon, who at that time was the ROC foreign minister, you can see a high level of sensitivity towards the differing perspectives of the two that I think was, was rather reassuring uh, for the solidity of the alliance. So I would argue that, that uh, uh, the, the U.S.-ROC alliance uh, has not in any way been undermined, well, not, not in any fundamental way, been undermined uh, by the developments of the post-Cold War world and is unlikely to in the foreseeable future, uh, and uh, that the one uh, potential issue that really could create uh, a, a dramatic problem would be this issue of the use of American forces uh, on the peninsula to uh, be involved in some kind of uh, campaign against China. Okay, I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Kim? Okay, thank you. Uh, uh, I appreciate the uh, for National Security Archive uh, and then Woodrow Wilson Center for preparing this uh, forum. 
uh, as a conclusion of our long stretch project uh, benefiting from the declassi declassified material uh, made by made available by National Security Archive led by uh, Dr. Robert Wempler. Uh, my, my chapter examined uh, what kind of role, how much role the United States has played uh, in for the sake of democratization of South Korea, right? uh, particularly focusing on the period from Richard Nixon administration until Ronald Reagan administration. It also includes uh, conclusion and implication as well as reflection upon what happened since the end of Cold War II until today, until recent uh, years. Uh, today I'll talk more about U.S. role for the democratization of South Korea from Nixon to Reagan administration and conclude with some implications of what is going on today in global arena where democratization is a big issue in other parts of the world. Uh, my conclusion first is United States has played a quite important role, uh, although it may not be crucial, but very instrumental role in transforming South Korea into democracy at the point of particularly 1987. Particularly, Reagan administration deserves greater credit, although its policy uh, to make Korea to tra be transformed into democracy benefited from better and the more uh, favorable security environment near the end of the Cold War. So let us examine uh, how each administration performed very briefly, 20 years uh, in less than 10 minutes of time. It's a quite daunting task. And Nixon administration uh, did not have a keen idea about democratization. It had a rather strategic design of trilateral diplomacy, reaching out to China, and then inaugurated detente diplomacy in East Asia. And then set menu was Nixon doctrine, which was reducing American military commitment uh, from its Asian allies, uh, South Korea and South Vietnam. In other words, reducing American troop levels in South Korea and Vietnam too. Right. Here, uh, Nixon administration implement, uh, implemented rather somewhat unilateral troop re reduction. Uh, in other words, withdrew one combat division out of Korea. There used to be two combat divisions, but uh, rather unilaterally notified Park, Park Chung hee government uh, of troop re reduction. And Park government uh, from 1971 adopted some countermeasures, uh, which was Park Chung hee government pursued inter-Korean dialogue at the same time pursued uh, self-reliance in its national defense, including a pursuit of uh, nuclear weapon for a couple of years at, at least. At the time, South Korea was pursuing nuclear weapon by inviting uh, dozens of South Korean scientists in abroad. Uh, it was later revealed by uh, American intelligence and then United States could uh, effectively uh, contain and stop, suspend this pursuit of nuclear weapon by 1975 and six. And then also Park government also introduced quite drastic domestic uh, political change, which was introduction of Shi Wal Yushin, uh, October Restoration, uh, constitutional reform in 1972, which made and allowed President Park to serve as a uh, lifelong president, uh, established, in other words, dictatorship in South Korea, which generated a lot of resistance by intellectuals and university students, uh, because uh, under the emergency law uh, measures, uh, President Park and his government could close down university and parliament and uh, arraign a lot of people. This generated a lot of resentment and mm -hmm. concern in US Congress and the American intellectual community as well. Uh, and then as to overcome this uh, uh, constraint, Park government also embarked upon active lobby effort in Washington DC to gain greater support from US congressmen and senators so that they could facilitate military assistance bill for South Korea because uh, Park government needed this very uh, badly at the time while US government was reducing its military commitment. This was the setting. However, Nixon doc administration did not exert pressure on Park government uh, while Park was going through uh, transformation into authoritarian control. Kissinger and the State Department officials were aware of this change, but sent nice diplomatic telegrams and signals uh, urging Park to not uh, harden its political control, but they let Park government pursue its own, own course in domestic political uh, changes. Uh, Ford administration uh, was more pragmatic and a bit more conservative because President Ford believed that uh, it was important to maintain credible de uh, deterrence uh, by maintaining U.S. troop level in South Korea. But on the front of democracy, democracy in South Korea uh, largely succeeded what uh, Nixon administration embarked on. And then uh, it was rather really transitional period of time. Meanwhile, the human rights issue became a big issue in U.S. Congress. And then there was the eruption of a Korea Gate scandal 
uh, by the revelation uh, of that uh, issue in by Washington Post report in October 1976. By this time, this uh, uh, Washington Post and other U.S. media re reported that there was a lot of illegal lobbying efforts by uh, uh, South Korean uh, lobbyists named Park dong uh centering around Georgetown Club in Washington, D.C., quite lavish parties were thrown. And then it was alleged that South Korean ambassador Kim Dong-jo was giving, offering some cash gift too. That was a somewhat speculative report. Uh, but this investigation led by uh, a notorious or famous uh, lawyer Leon Jorowski, who was rather in charge, uh, used to be in charge of Watergate's uh, investigation, uh, generated a lot of political uh, uh, discussion and heated debate was going on in Washington, D.C. So, in Congress, meanwhile, the human rights issue in South Korea became a big issue. So congressmen were not happy with uh, Park's authoritarian control. And then uh, passing this kind of foreign military assistance bill uh, for to help out South Korea was became more tricky and difficult. Right? This was a border administration. A rather transitional period of time, uh, Congress came to take uh, uh, big attention and play a big role uh, in U.S.-Korean relations although administration remained rather transitional in dealing with the Korean case. Meanwhile, Ford administration could successfully suspend the South Korea's pursuit of nuclear weapon. Basically, it's the administration could uh, notify or threaten South Korea that the fundamental revision of U.S.-South uh, Korean alliance may be uh, considered in case South Korea pursued its nuclear weapon project. And also, United States could close uh, South Korean export market to the United States, which was a big issue. And then Park government uh, chose uh, to suspend its nuclear weapons program by 1986. Carter administration and Reagan administration become more interesting in the case of uh, U.S. diplomacy to promote dip uh, democracy in South Korea. It shows such a parallel and contrast. Carter administration started with a big slogan. You know, Carter uh, claimed from the before his inauguration during the presidential election campaign that he would restore morality and human rights in U.S. foreign policy. You know, would not United States would not support authoritarian rulers in the uh, third world just because of for the sake of containment of the communism at the time. But this deprived of the administration uh, effective leverage to influence South Korean politics because had he utilized this truth withdrawal issue uh, by linking it with human rights conditions in South Korea, he could have secured more room to promote democracy in South Korea. But by declaring it from the beginning, the president himself removed this important diplomatic leverage. Therefore, Park was not very much listening, receptive to Carter's message to promote human rights condition and then reduce authoritarian control in South Korea, right? President Carter even tried to proselytize President Park into Christianity while visiting Seoul in 1978 or 9, I'm sorry. Uh, but it didn't work out. But the more uh, dramatic turnover, which was characterized as, quote unquote, massive entanglement, marginal influence, it is his title of memoir by Ambassador William Gleistin, uh, reflecting upon his experience uh, during the coup d'etat and then uh, following the death of President Park Chung Yi. Uh, Park Chung Yi was assassinated by his uh, intelligence chief Kim Jae Gyu in October 1979. And then the subsequent development led to Gwangju massacre by the subsequent leader, General Chun Doo who later became president of South Korea from 1981. So United States tried to do something to prevent to nudge or push South Korea toward democratization, but following the assassination of Park Chung Hee, the strongman, the new military uh, junta or junta uh, led by Chun Doo Hwan just uh, pursued the strategy of uh, fait accompli. You know, just took initiative. United States representative, both U.S. embassy in Seoul or U.S. military uh, commander General uh, Wickham, uh, representing U.S. military forces in South Korea, could do few things. The biggest reason of the constraint was national security concern, because at, was, at, the, at the time of so-called new Cold War in East Asia, and there are various concerns that North Korea may ta might take advantage of civil war situation in case they supported other opposing general or uh, citizen uh, during the while the Chun was suppressing pro-democracy movement in spring 1980, and then during the Gwangju massacre. Even during Gwangju massacre of uh, May 1980. Uh, U.S. Uh, represented in Seoul was were well aware of the development bloody situation in Gwangju, but largely took permissive action. Uh, of course, they sent uh, diplomatic warning that Yoo Chun and uh, supporters should follow constitutional procedure in South Korea. But that was rather rhetorical because the constitution of South Korea at the time had been made by uh, Park Chung Hee days, 
in that allowed Park Chung Hee to remain as a uh, lifelong ruler because the president was supposed to be selected through electoral college of 5,000 elders, uh, facilitating the election of the existing president. So this is the case. So there is marginal influence despite goodwill, and then there is a few diplomatic liberties. The final case is Reagan administration, which was interestingly more effective. Uh, Reagan administration had different uh, outlook and doctrine, which was captured by Ambassador Jean Kirkpatrick, who was U.S. ambassador to the uh, United Nations at the time. Kirkpatrick argued that it's better to support uh, authoritarian rulers in third world because they can be eventually transformed into democrat democracy uh, and also still remains effective in containing communism, right? So they supported, extended uh, recognition to early recognition to Chen Duan regime. And then they could get some goodwill uh, from Chen Duan and instead Chen Duan suspended its missile program and nuclear weapons project and also commuted life sentence, death sentence imposed upon uh, South Korean presidential, former presidential candidate Kim Dae-jung and then later eventually let, let Kim Dae-jung go to the United States for exile, right? Uh, this was incremental uh, effort to nudge South Korea to a democratization in early 1980s. But more dramatic event occurred in from 1987, uh, 85, and then 87, when South Korea, uh, in South Korea, there was enormous public uprising or resistance movement against Chen Duan, demanding direct presidential election and democratization. Here, uh, in this scene, the uh, other opposition leaders within uh, South Korean politics, Kim Dae Jung and Kim Jong Sam, could play great role because they could play uh, substantial influence through the elected parliament members, although it was a quite constrained democracy at the time under Chun's iron control. <laughs> Finally, from 19 spring of 1987, there was a big uprising, people power movement in South Korea. On this occasion, the uh, United States sent an uh, unequivocal message in support of democratization. Uh, Gaston Seeger, who was assist assistant secretary of state at the time in Reagan administration, sent a clear signal through his speech and through his visit during the high top crisis uh, generated by a public uprising to demanding democracy. And James Lilly, uh, as well as, uh, uh, James Lilly was U.S. ambassador to Seoul. And then also Im Lilly had studied why uh, uh, during Carter administration they couldn't achieve democratization of South Korea. And then he tried to present a joint stance with the U.S. commander in South Korea to the Chun government. The message is clearly that you know, we would oppose any use of force against uh, this uh, public demonstration uh, demanding uh, democratization of South Korea. And then also at the time, the ruling part, uh, ruling leader, Chun Doo-hwan and his success, designated successor, Ro Tae-woo, could find nice ex the alternative option because they thought that because the opposition eventually, the democracy, democracy camp will be divided. Therefore, even through direct presidential election after constitutional reform uh, toward democratization, they Roteu, who was a former general, could win the election. That was what happened. So th in this context, uh, the strongman, uh, Ch President Chun Doo-hwan, and his designated successor, Roteu, accepted uh, the constitutional change toward direct presidential election in uh, June 29th of 1987. So from this point on, South Korea became democracy, right? And then the traditional transition was made rather smoothly, and the uh, presidential election was concluded as the victory of President Roteu, who became democratic leader through democratic procedure, although he will have military background. And then democracy became rather fully blown since that time on. The conclusion is you, know, you need to have a uh, good uh, alternative solution for strongmen to induce a democratization. And also it's important to maintain kind of leverage to influence the domestic politics of target state, uh, uh, like South Korea or other country, to achieve democratization if possible. I conclude here, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Mr. Brzezinski. Okay, um, I'd like to thank Bob uh, for helping to put together this project, and of course, uh, thank the thank the Wilson Center. It's always a pleasure to be back here. Uh, you might have gotten some sense of this by now, but Bob's idea in this volume was you get a bunch of documents, important documents about U.S. policy and the Korean Peninsula declassified. And then you give the documents to the scholars and see what they can do with them. So my first blush effort at this was actually to try to do something that built on my previous book, Nation Building in South Korea. And I even drafted an essay like that. And then I said, but you know, I, 
there's not that much new here. And so I wanted to do something that was sort of new and interesting to me. And I started to become more interested in China. So I proposed to Bob, why don't I just completely throw out the draft that I gave you and I'm going to do something new uh, about China. And at, at first he was a little bit skeptical, mm -hmm. I think. Uh, but then I slowly but surely convinced him I also got a trickle of new Chinese sources. I was interested in writing about China's policy towards the Korean Peninsula during this period, the 1970s, 1980s, and 1990s, which is the period uh, from which most of the documents that Bob uh, got declassified came from. I was interested in doing this because it's really a, a fascinating and interesting period in the history of China's foreign policy and China's engagement with the rest of the world. You have China at this time slowly coming out of the ideological excesses of the Cultural Revolution and orienting itself towards the world in very different ways. And so I was interested in this question of how did this impact Chinese diplomacy towards the Korean Peninsula, towards both North and South Korea. And the essay that I've written for this volume, I call it Between Ideology and Strategy. And my basic argument is that during this period between 1972 and 1992, China moved away from a foreign policy towards the Korean Peninsula that was governed primarily by ideological considerations uh, deriving, of course, from uh, notions of international communism and uh, you know, uh, sp uh, spreading revolution at the international stage towards a more strategic, pragmatic, and tactical policy. What were the concerns that were part of this? I, I identified three. First, China wanted to control North Korean adventurism a little bit. In 1968, there had been the Pueblo incident in which North Korea captured an American spy ship. A year later, it shot down an EC-121 US uh, airplane. China, you, you might say, well, what is this to China? The North Koreans capture an American ship, shoot down an American plane. Why didn't China say good for them? The reason is because they were worried about stability. They didn't want North Korea to engage in these kinds of provocative actions that could lead to another conflict on the Korean Peninsula that could draw China in. China's policy was also motivated during this period by an interest in greater engagement with South Korea. China's economy was changing, and as it did so, it had more and more in common with South Korea, a greater and greater interest in attracting foreign investment from South Korea. Third, China wanted to restore its influence on the Korean Peninsula. The Cultural Revolution had really been this period in which China had withdrawn from the world in a lot of ways. It had become involved in ideological conflicts with the Soviet Union and even with North Korea, which had once been one of its closest allies. The two had been calling each other revisionists throughout the late 60s. And so China's influence in the Korean Peninsula had declined. In the early 1970s, it wants to restore it. How did it try to do that? How did it try to achieve these foreign policy objectives and concerns. I argue that a lot of it was through detente. And how did it work? I think there's a vast literature on small states and large states. How can small states manipulate the larger states? Why in international politics does the tail always wag the dog? There's a ton of literature on this. But there's never, there's, there's much less literature on how does the dog get control of its tail back? Uh, the tail can't always wag the dog. Mm -hmm. Sometimes the dog wags the tail, right? And so I was interested in what did China do to try to 
get North Korea under control. And I found that detente was a key part of this strategy. Uh, Jeremy Surrey, in his path-breaking book, Power and Protest, has argued that political leaders in the United States, China, and elsewhere use detente to try to control social movements in their country. I try to expand on this a little bit and say that the, the great powers also try to use detente to get control over their client states. And the way it works is that when you have Cold War frictions, you need as many client states, you need as many allies as you can get. And so the allies have a greater capacity to manipulate you. But when you pursue detente and there's less friction between the superpowers, the superpowers need for uh, client states decreases somewhat and their leverage increases. And so what I found is that this strategy actually worked uh, for Beijing and put it in a stronger position vis-a-vis -vis countries such as North Korea and helped to make China a more influential player on the Korean Peninsula. Between 1972 and 1992, China really moved, I would argue, towards becoming the very influential player on the Korean Peninsula that it is today. Today, it's really only China that has a significant influence in both North Korea and South Korea. I don't think there's any other uh, great power uh, that, that has that. And I, I think it did this through this very strategic uh, movement in its foreign policy. North Koreans recognized that they couldn't manipulate China the way that it, they had been able to do during the 50s and the 60s. And China was able to, and, and for China seeking the, be, be, because, because for China seeking leadership in the communist world was less important. And so China was able to gradually improve its relations with South Korea without completely alienating North Korea in, this, in a way that the Soviets did to some degree. China did three things with North Korea in this period between 1972 and 1992. First, it increased its economic interaction with South Korea. Trade offices were opened. Opportunities for South Korean foreign investment to flow into China were created. And you had, even before relations were normalized, you had a great deal of informal trade between South Korea and China. Some of it went through Hong Kong. Some of it went through other channels. Second, China started to increase its cultural exchanges with South Korea during this period. Uh, North Korea wasn't very happy, of course, uh, at, uh, when, when the 1988 Olympics were held in Seoul. Uh, China, though, wanted to be part of that and be part of uh, other cultural activities that, were, you know, that, that South Korea was involved in. And so these economic and cultural ties with South Korea were pursued, but North Korea, although they weren't happy about it, because they didn't have the leverage to manipulate and put demands on Beijing that they used to, couldn't really stop China from doing this. These economic and cultural ties ultimately led, of course, to political normalization between China and South Korea uh, in 1992. And again, with this, you really have China becoming uh, an influential player in both Koreas. So I argue that it's this shift in Chinese policy away from ideology towards strategy that enabled China to rein in North Korea to some degree, help to contribute to stability on the Korean Peninsula, and expand its influence on, in Korea. Bob also asked us to sort of come away, what, what can you take away from your essay that's useful for policymakers? And I, I think there were two main things that I emphasized in the end of this essay. One is that China has a common influence in the stability of the Korean Peninsula. 
They don't have an interest in seeing conflict between North and South Korea. Uh, but even though there's this common interest, China also is very much interested in maintaining, preserving, and expanding its own influence on Korea. And that's something where we have strategic interests that are different from Beijing's. And I'll end there. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Chinworth? Thank you, Bob. Um, oh, everybody can hear me? I want to thank um, all the organizers of, of the project uh, of this event. Uh, it's very kind of you to include us um, in this project. I personally feel grateful also to Professors Yun and Michista, who obviously could not make it, uh, who are my co-authors for our chapter. Um, they made outstanding contributions despite geographic separation, and I really appreciate having the opportunity to work with them. Um, any problems with the chapter, it's all their fault, okay? <laughs> Um, we, we were given the task of looking forward, learning from the past to look forward, and of course if, um, if I was that good at predictions, I would have retired many, many, many years ago. But um, when we looked at this trilateral notion, we started by thinking that, well, when you say trilateral cooperation, it implies a, a whole, you know, three countries who are happily getting along together, and I'm simplifying it a little bit, but that's not the case. Uh, what we saw from the examples of the past and uh, our current relations as they're being uh, implemented today is that um, there, there are differences, and this doesn't necessarily come as a shock. It's reiterated in some of the other chapters, but there are significant differences, and in many cases, there is a distinct willingness for one of these uh, allies to use a situation to its own benefit and, uh, and extracting leverage uh, from its al uh, allied partner. Um, we go into the details in the chapter, be sure to buy a book, That's, they're out on sale on the front. Um, having said that, uh, cooperation does build ties. Um, there's, but these ties, again, have not formed in a distinct triangle. We, what we see is parallel sets of bilateral relationships. Uh, we see a US-Japan relationship, we see a US South Korea relationship, we see a Korea-Japan relationship. Um, not in a harmonious triangle, but parallel sets. I have to share a story with you real quick. At one time we were trying to, we were groping with this notion of how do we characterize this, and one person suggested, well, it's really like a neutron and a proton and an electron, and all these particles kind of circle around one another, and they have different uh, uh, magnetisms and different electrical qualities and all the rest, but in the end they all hold together. Um, then we realized that describing U.S.-Japan uh, and Korean relationship in terms of a, of a nuclear relationship or an atomic relationship might not be the best choice of words, so we went with this parallel notion. One of the difficulties in managing this and one of the reasons for this situation is that we see different levels of maturation institutionally in these three countries. For example, um, my, my tend to look first towards Japan, but in, with Japan you have a quest for uh, legitimacy within the defense agency and the, and the public as a whole. Uh, I'd argue that that quest is still uh, a pursuit, and it's only with really a, a massive earthquake and tsunami where you see more public acceptance of the very existence of a defense force um, in Japan. That hampers broader cooperation among three countries. Uh, the U.S., I mean, excuse me, uh, South Korea and Japan have their historical legacy that um, clearly influences uh, current day interactions and the rest. So what we tried to do was to look at different crises over time and illustrate these qualities through analysis of these um, crises uh, to indicate that responses in each case by each country may have varied. There, there's not a lot of consistency in many cases in reactions and responses uh, to in crisis management situations. Having said that, um, there is growth and there's evidence of that, but again, it's not in terms of three countries coming together in solidarity, but instead it's allowing to uh, each country to manage its security interests and its security concerns more autonomously in parallel with one another and in the context of a broader cooperative relationship. So anybody hoping for a trilateral, a formal trilateral security treaty among Korea, Japan, and the United States should not hold their breath. That's one of the major uh, conclusions of our chapter. 
now we get into the future part. Well, how do we, how do we uh, predict the events in the future and what this means? Well, first, it clearly is that uh, there are differences uh, among the three countries. Um, not surprising, but it's always worth reminding ourselves of that. We have differences in threat perceptions and respective security goals, and these differences will continue. Um, not surprising, but again, good to remind ourselves of that because that means that when a specific problem arises, there could very well be different responses, different priorities, and different efforts to use the relationships for possibly one's own benefit. Um, this underscores the need for continued communication, continued cooperation, continued confidence building measures of this sort. Uh, what I'd like to do actually is to quote from Bob's introduction because I think he actually summarizes it better than the authors of our chapter. Um, it says, what the future holds is that, continuation, that the continuation of current trends will take the three nations toward continued coordination but as independent allied powers in the region with greater autonomy in the conduct of their security affairs. And I would add that that's not necessarily a bad thing. And one final word, and I hope I won't run over um, my time, but I, I have to give uh, a great deal of credit to the National Security Archive. Um, it's, I, I think what the archive does is fabulous. Um, many of, in, in the, the writing of our chapter, we looked at a lot of the documents that had been uh, declassified and all the rest and thought, well, mm, not seeing a lot of th new things here, but what it also means is that, well, maybe we really do understand what has happened in the past and can uh, make uh, steps in the future based on our knowledge and understanding of the past. And of course, in some cases, there were some uh, quite interesting uh, disclosures through the course of this project. I would say that in either case, whether it's quote unquote nothing new or a, a, you know, a dramatic discovery that gets front page uh, coverage on the Washington Post, it's essential that this kind of activity continues. Uh, because quite frankly, and as we all know, there are severe consequences uh, in acting on incomplete or incorrect uh, information in the world of foreign policy, and we know what they are. So I would say cheers to the security, National Security Archive, and um, again, you know, thank you for uh, allowing me to be part of the project. There you go. Thank you. <laughs> Professor Mock? Oops. Thank you very much for excellent presentations and uh, the papers, their papers as well. I was actually uh, given a very daunting task to address, you know, well, a variety of issues, a variety of uh, relationships between countries in around the, the Korean Peninsula. And also in terms of time scope, it comprises of the, the past and future as well. So the, the task as a discussant uh, to address all the issues is almost impossible, I think. I would like to focus some of the issues uh, that I think is, uh, which is relevant for the entire volume instead of giving uh, small points that I'd like to ask, actually, that I might like to raise, but I think that will not pretty uh, appropriate. Uh, in at this uh, time. The first one, the first theme I'd like to uh, raise is the, the relationship between the understanding of the future or past and uh, its uh, importance for the understanding of the, the current, I current affairs. Not many works actually attempt uh, this kind of work. Uh, the policy or communities always somehow is uh, observed by the, the flow of information on the current affairs, but they do not have much time to think about what is the background and what is the context, historic context in which the current affairs have grown up. So I think uh, this volume gives us a very good access to the history and with which we can understand the current affairs with uh, the proper uh, historical background and context. I also uh, praise the, uh, this project because it also utilized the, a lot of uh, newly declassified material. Uh, probably that material, those materials are taken from the uh, National Security uh, Archives and I, 
I, I think um, uh, most many of them are already available for public use and, and research. And so I think I would like to uh, ask and suggest many of you in the audience uh, in the uh, might have a chance to look at the uh, the actual documents available from the National Security Archive. Uh, having said that, I have some doubts or questions or troubles reading the entire volume. The, the, the biggest one that I have trouble was the title. The, t the volume is titled as a, uh, entitled Trilateralism and Beyond, and subtitle is Great Power Politics and the Korean Security Dilemma during, the, during and after the Cold War. The most troubling one of those uh, words uh, in the title and subtitle to me is trilateralism. Actually, only two chapters directly uh, concern is co are concerned about trilateralism in the volume, which is about U.S., South Korea, and Japan relationship. Other chapters, uh, well, t not very tangentially, uh, deals with trilateralism itself. Uh, Professor Stooks and Professor Kim's uh, art, well, chapters only deals with U.S., Korea, South Korean alliance. Uh, Professor Brzezinski's and others, or uh, Professor Redchenko's, are dealing with only, you know, the other kind of trilateral or quadrilateral relations. So I, uh, the, the first question that I come to with uh, this volume was, why, why trilateralism? Of course, trilateralism or tri triangular relationship always uh, fascinates people. Love triangle, for example, always fascinates us. You know, well, men, women, and the other men <laughs> 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 always fascinates us, <coughs> our imaginations. But, well, from the Korea South Korean perspective, for well, in particular. Uh, if we talk about trilateralism or tri trilateral uh, triangular relationship nowadays, probably U.S., China, Korea, U.S., China, South Korea, U.S., China, North Korea, probably those two triangular relationships uh, attracts more attention these days than U.S., Korea, South Korea, I mean, and Japan relationship. So I, I, I came to wonder, why trilateralism? And if a trilateral relationship or trilateralism was taken as a common theme that penetrates the volume, why not well, the other triangular relationship? I practice as, uh, exercise some of the very well, elementary mathematical exercise. There are at least six major powers or, or states around surrounding the Korean Peninsula. Uh, if, if, if we make three, combina three states among them, we can make 20 combinations from the six. And why we only focus on then uh, US, Japan, and South Korea? So, well, that was my major probably uh, uh, dissatisfaction with the volume, especially actually about the, the title that is given to it. I might, if I, uh, if I was a uh, well, member of this uh, project, uh, probably I would suggest probably uh, uh, some other alternative way of uh, naming the title. Uh, my way of uh, understanding the dynamics between or surrounding the Korean Peninsula uh, probably give more attention to rise and falls of uh, power of states. We have witnessed it after at least uh, uh, mid-1960s, the rapid growth of the South Korean influence in the region. And we have witnesses at least after uh, the 1980s and 90s the very rapid growth of the Chinese influence in the region and the world as well. And we have witnessed it after the Cold War, 
the collapse of the Soviet Union and it's it has been somehow fallen out of the uh, well power games. Of course, it is coming back again, though. And Japan has always been a power which has a considerable influence, but at the same time, it's constrained by their by its own con well, well, cons well constitutional and cultural well matters. So those well power ups and ups and downs of power relationship probably is another uh, alternative to organize the entire volume. The other uh, alternative that I came to think about as an alternative is a, a identity. The democratization, which was dealt by the uh, Professor Kim's paper, is I think is one of the important uh, issue we can, we and we have to think about how the changes, or well, how the changes or continuities of identity of the people of the states affected the relationship around or surrounding the Korean Peninsula. Probably that's another venue we can investigate more. Well, uh, I will give some well, comments and questions on individual papers as well. Uh, first of all, I, I really appreciated uh, Professor Stuke's analysis of the uh, trends of the U.S. and Iraq alliance uh, that started from 1950s uh, toward, uh, and then up to the current, uh, current uh, period. And I do agree with him that the, the United States had a uh, very somehow ambivalent uh, stance towards the, the Korea its in, in its Korea policy. It has been committed to Korean uh, defense, but at the same time, it had a very strong interest, always, well, the revival of uh, uh, those interests to withdraw uh, its troop commitment from Korea. But I do want to uh, emphasize, if I uh, am uh, a contributor to the project, probably I'll, I'll pay more atten pay another attention to what were the influence, impact of those uh, American ambivalent or changing attitude in its troop commitment uh, to South Korea. Uh, S Professor Stug actually mentioned that the there were two kind of legacies of the uh, U.S. troop policy in 1970s and 80s. Uh, in on the one hand, uh, Korean elites of the uh, probably Korean leadership, government leadership, was dissatisfied with the, the, the American policy and at the same time they were felt being uh, kind of uh, mistrustful of the American commitment. And secondly, he also mentioned that the the South Korean students and civil society were, you know, betray feeling, you know, uh, uh, also betrayed because no South uh, no U U.S. policy did not really su uh, support the uh, the democratic movement in in the country. I think that well, the first, especially the the first point and uh, the, the second point also uh, somehow related to uh, Professor Kim's. Uh, paper on the democratiza democratization and American policy towards that in, in, in South Korea. Because I think, you know, South Korean leaders and elites groups in both government and so civil society were uh, somehow betrayed and discontent with the U.S. policy in 1970s and 80s. I think it's quite natural. The new military group which was taking the, the political power in right after the assassination of President Park was quite natural, you know. They were quite naturally were geared not to listen to the American influence, American advice. So, the, the well, quite contrary to the, the Professor Stuck's emphasis on the rationality and and he said rationality actually prevails uh, over the ideology and emotions 
in some parts of the uh, relationship, I think emotions and you know ideology, not probably ideology, but Im emotions did affect the the trajectory of the the development of the relationship. As I said, well, during the 1970s and 80s, there has been continued discussions of uh, the withdrawal of American troops from South Korea. That made the fear of abandonment in South Korean leaders' mind, and they began to cultivate, therefore, they need to, well, make self-reliance as, as their motto of their policy. Being self-reliant and being less dependent on the U.S. assistant and, you know, being somehow betrayed, well, their alternative course of action is quite evident. Regarding Kim's and Professor Kim's uh, article or paper, I, I quite uh, appreciate his uh, article because I, my own uh, research project is also about the, the, the democratic promotion in South Korea uh, by the American government. In, in but uh, my uh, period of time is actually from 1960 to 72. So his his paper actually uh, very nicely complements uh, my own, and uh, I learned a lot from his uh, uh, paper. But but there are some several questions. The first one is, uh, he said, uh, the, the, the American influence in 1979 and 1980 was quite marginal. Uh, probably that marginal influence, the term marginal influence for term was from, uh, taken, was taken from uh, William Gleiston, uh, Ambassador Gleiston's uh, memoir, uh, published later. Uh, but I wonder uh, that marginality was really the case uh, because Professor Kim also wrote in his uh, paper that the American assessment and, uh, and, and assessment of the uh, well internal dynamics in the South Korean military was somehow misled. And uh, the new group uh, which uh, rise to power was actually not that very not as strong as much as American government had uh, appraised. So I came to wonder why the American government miscalculated the situation right after the assassination of uh, Park Jong hee And secondly, he nicely uh, described the American role in the democratization that really took place in 1987. But having said that, another question comes arise. The marginal influence was really the case in 1980. Then we can say probably even marginal influence we can expect in 1987 because of the continuing uh, you know, growth of the South Korean economy and, well, in accordingly, South Korean influence or uh, uh, self-reliance in, in, in that era. So my question was, if the marginality was the, the, was the real uh, cause of the American, you know, inaction in 1980, why Americans could do something, very positive role in 87? And what were the, the different conditions made those uh, different outcomes and different, you know, uh, actions? Okay. Regarding uh, Greg Brzezinski's uh, excellent paper, I, I do agree uh, with his uh, argument that the uh, South uh, China probably uh, had uh, was very single-handed. Uh, purpose of uh, maintaining stability in, s in the Korean Peninsula. And it's quite useful uh, to look at the historical evolvement of those uh, well Chinese strategy 
we, we are currently witnessing that the China will always uh, prioritize stability in the Korean Peninsula. And for that stability, China always uh, you know, refused to exercise stronger measure toward North Korea, despite the American pressure and well, South Korean well, requests as well. Uh, and he demonstrated uh, that uh, posture of uh, China is not taken uh, overnight, and it has been evolved over at least a decade. So it is quite useful, very much useful. Uh, but in, in, some in his uh, narrative, I, I, uh, well, uh, as I said, I, I, I quite agree with his overall argument. But uh, in details, in some of the details, I have some questions as well. The first one was, uh, he raised a quite very interesting argument that the, the Chinese uh, leadership were very much concerned about you know, authoritarian tendency uh, in the period of uh, 1979 and to 1980, in the period of uh, the, uh, the, uh, well failed, well failed democratization in South Korea. Uh, Greg argued that the Chinese were concerned about the maintaining the stability in the Korean Peninsula and the, the growing and, and in enhancing enhanced authoritarianism in South Korea might have uh, brought uh, instability in the Korean Peninsula. So, so that's why Chinese were opposing the new military groups rising in, in, s in the South Korean domestic politics. But I came to wonder, China was supporting more democracy in South Korea? Then, well, that's very, that's that itself, that argument itself is very contrasting to China's current uh, you know, attitude and China's current position uh, on the democratization of the Chinese society itself. So how could uh, he uh, manage to reconcile the, the current Chinese perception on Chinese democracy itself and how, and on the one hand and on the other, uh, Chinese position towards uh, chi uh, South Korea's democratization issue in back in 1980. Secondly, uh, probably uh, Greg was somehow uh, misled about the uh, South Korean uh, efforts to establish and, and, and uh, establish a diplomatic relationship with China. Uh, he is correct in, in, in when he say that the informal uh, trade relationship has been uh, there before the normalization of uh, relationship in 1992 and that diplomatic uh, but what i wanted to say is that the uh, there were very explicit uh, south korean governmental efforts before the the trade relationship was blowing uh, well the going up uh, in 1983 there was an incident that the chinese civilian aircraft uh, you know landed in, in South Korean uh, military, South Korean uh, territory within uh, the, the American uh, air base in, in Chuncheon area, in Gangwon-do. According to a uh, chief negotiator at the time of the Korean foreign ministry, who, was, who later became the, the foreign minister of, of South Korea, uh, whose name is Gong no myung he was the chief negotiator uh, with Chinese counterpart. Uh, that accident was taken place, as you said, as I said, in 1983 at the height of the new Cold War, so-called. And Chinese had no intention to actually have a bargaining with South Koreans. But South Korean government at the time took the incident as an opportunity to expand and imp improve the relations with China. And afterwards, and according to uh, uh, the, the, the chief negotiator, it was the moment. Well, it was the turning point 
that imp well, the improvement of the bilateral relationship between China and South Korea. So I, I, I wanted to s emphasize there were the very explicit uh, South Korean governmental efforts before the, the trade relationship blossomed. And you know, it was 1983 as once again. A very dictatorial regime was in place in Seoul. And dictatorial regime had the power to kill any conglomerates. The very, very example of Daewoo, which it was uh, famous for uh, its uh, global business. But once with uh, the, the government, government decision, the conglomerates was disbanded in 1997. It was 1983 was an even harsher period for Korean diplom uh, Korean businessmen. The Korean businessmen had to follow the directions given from the government, and governmental power on the business world was very, very strong. So it, I, from my understanding, I think, well, from my understanding, it's quite uh, difficult to see the Korean businessmen went ahead of governmental direction in exploiting and, and in, in, in searching for a new market in China. What I want to say is that the, the politics and diplomacy and strategy went ahead of the, the, the economic relationships in that time. But that having said that, uh, this is a uh, kind of trivial things, and uh, I, I do agree with uh, uh, Professor Brzezinski's uh, overall argument that stability always trumped the other ideological issues, concerns uh, from the Chinese in, in Chinese policy to a, uh, toward the uh, Korean Peninsula. Mr. Chinworth and others uh, had uh, another excellent paper. I do agree with his uh, and, and his uh, co-authors our conclusion that probably trilateralism in a formal sense is not in place and probably will not be in, in place in the f foreseeable future. Actually, I, I remember uh, quite vividly when uh, uh, Professor Victor Cha uh, 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 published his uh, uh, very well-known book uh, on U.S.-Korea-Japan relationship. I had trouble with that book, uh, not a formal trouble, but reading those books, I, I, I could not really by his uh, central argument, without American presence in 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 in, in Korean Peninsula, uh, he argued that the the China and I'm sorry, uh, Japan and South Korea will be heading towards will be going towards the uh, more uh, closer, much closer relationship. But uh, well, that book actually uh, pub was published in I remember in 1998 or nine, already. Uh, over a decade uh, passed, and we are still witnessing uh, difficulties in the Korea-Japan relationship. Recently, there was a uh, kind of an episode of uh, uh, the well, the chief uh, uh, advisor for the president in South Korea in, in the diplomatic relationship resigned because of uh, the scandal. Uh, on the uh, Japan Korea in military relation military in intelligence sharing uh, accord those accords were uh, made uh, without public knowledge in South Korea and and and, and, and media uh, lowered when uh, it was known and immediately uh, president was angry and and fired uh, his long trusted uh, well aides in his national security council uh, that actually revealed how seriously koreans were concerned about the historical animosity and how that animosity still you know make the relationship very difficult i think uh, the intelligence sharing between china uh, between japan and korea is necessary especially uh, for the management of uh, 
crisis. When, when it happened, we need a c coordination. But even the, that, that well very elementary level of uh, co coordination and, and the necessary uh, institutional mechanism is somehow denied by the public in Korea. So we can not really you know, exclude those historical animosity factor or public perception of well, each country in ch Korea vis-a-vis -vis Japan and Japan vis-a-vis -vis South Korea. Uh, we, 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 we should not be very cautious uh, in, in, in those areas. And, and, and in that, in that uh, terms, I, I do agree with somehow very modest and, uh, and, and uh, very realistic uh, proposal and also appraisal of the current status of a tri triangular relationship between Korea, Japan, and the U.S. Thank you. Um, to first of all, uh, the issue of the title, that's a meta issue. We will take it <laughs> up over drinks. <laughs> um, I'd like to give the presenters a chance to respond immediately, and then we'll have questions and answers. So if you have a specific responses you'd like to make, uh, S.Y., you want to start? Yeah, th while listening to Professor Ma's comment, I realized again that the somewhat interdisciplinary approach is quite popular these days. I mean, between theoretical study of international relations and the study of international or diplomatic history, I'd rather answer it in a lump, uh, broad way, although it may not be answering specific questions. Uh, when we look at American foreign policy, uh, many people have pointed out that the United States tend to promote democracy no matter what happens. This is can be couched in the cultural context of American impulse or the sense of mission to promote democracy by the practice of its foreign policy. Another school, really school, have claimed that, well, the United States have pursued national security interest as uh, first priority. My paper says that uh, both dynamic operates in U.S. policy toward Korea, but I am a bit more realist in the sense that when security interests prevail, was dominant in, and uh, quite overriding, then the United States made a compromise uh, in its impulse or tendency to promote democracy. Carter is administration in a macro level was the case. Uh, it had started with a good ample goodwill and then sense of morality and mission to promote democracy as was embodied and articulated by President Carter from his presidential candidate days. But when faced with this uh, overriding constraint in the era of new Cold War, and there are a good deal of intelligence report that North Korea may, might take advantage of a civil war situation in South Korea, then Carter administration or uh, Holbrook or other uh, leading uh, de decision makers restrained their impulse uh, to promote democracy to serve better America's national security interests. Whereas the Reagan administration, of course, there's an idiosyncratic element. Reaganite was somewhat neocon-like approach. But also it was true that Reagan administration was operating in a favorable security environment near the end of the Cold War. The threat from North Korea is not that eminent, and North Korean capability was not as, as strong as later Carter days. The right? United States, uh, during Carter days even, suspended U.S. troop withdrawal as of uh, February 1979 uh, because of new intelligence assessment about North Korea's mechanized uh, combat divisions. Uh, an well, another way of answering is uh, my our paper, because following the direction of uh, those Professor Ma's comment was very relevant and uh, very useful. Uh, uh, we wanted to compare the performance of different administrations in their set foreign policy goals. My chapter was addressing America's effort to promote democracy. And the Carter administration, as I presented during my talk, uh, was not as effective and efficient, or despite its uh, ambitious uh, moralistic uh, statement or commitment to promote democracy. It was uh, bound by various realities in South Korea. Whereas Reagan administration, uh, despite its uh, tainted reputation because of what happened in uh, Latin America during Reagan days, was more pragmatic and effective in promoting democracy by pursuing rather incremental approach and seizing the momentum uh, when there was public uprise uh, for the pe or people power movement in South Korea. Uh, having said that, I still have emphasized that the main dynamic for the democratization for South Korea came from popular uh, Korean people's resistance and their yearning for democracy. Although I know that Professor Brzezinski would say that, well, the United States paved the way in the 1960s by introducing various institutions and culture uh, toward democratization. I agree with that. Uh, but having said that, that is my response. Thank you.
Um, a couple of things. Um, uh, one, how could China, you know, support uh, or criticize authoritarianism in South Korea when it's, you know, itself is an authoritarian society? Hypocritical, yes, but this China perceived uh, democratization uh, as in its self-interest. Uh, instability was not in its self-interest. And so, uh, as I think you still see today to some degree, China's foreign policy tends to be gu uh, guided uh, more by self-interest than by whether or not there's uh, a, a hypocritical element to it. Um, I, I think I, I would disagree with your characterization that it's the, that's the that's, it's political relations leading economic relations. Uh, there is significant trade, in, there's a significant increase in trade between South Korea and China during the 1970s through Hong Kong before the 1983 incident. So I think there's some uh, economic relations preceding uh, this, this political relations. Uh, and uh, I'm, not, I'm not saying that the businesses were acting completely independently of the state, uh, but I am saying that there's, there's you know, th that, that doesn't mean that uh, economic relations uh, did not precede uh, more formal political ties. Uh, that's, that's the point I was trying to make. I, it's, I'm not really, uh, I, I think in both China and South Korea, uh, you know, the economy is heavily controlled by the state during this period, uh, but uh, I, I think they, both states chose to let uh, economic actors go first. Just very briefly, uh, the, the comment on, on rationality prevailing over emotion and ideology, um, there are certainly times in the U.S.-Korean alliance where ideology and emotion have potentially disrupted the relationship, but my argument is that ultimately <laughs> rationality, that is the rational actor model, the people at the top making a decision that it's in both nations' interest, each making that decision, uh, has prevailed. Um, no, I just thank you for the comments, and I'd, I'd cede my time to the audience. Okay, so, uh, yeah. uh, questions? People have, uh, we have someone with a mic. Please introduce yourself to the um, My name is Stephen Shore. Is there an end game in this whole structure in the sense that we have periodic rumors or hopes that the North Korea will collapse and um, would um, is is North Korea essentially Korea is D Korea's DDR that could the North be absorbed? Is it likely that it will be absorbed or uh, under is it that under no circumstances does China want a reunified Korea? Um, I, yeah, I mean, I think in terms of what China wants, it, it does, it, it right now, it does not want uh, a unified Korea. I, I always think that a unified Korea is, is more in China's interests than it knows that it is, um, beca because I do think that it would create sort of a lasting, stabilizing solution. Uh, but, uh, China is worried one about you know a collapse scenario in North Korea and the f you know a flow of refugees uh, and they're also you know the the other point that I made in my essay is they're concerned about their influence. Uh, what will happen to Chinese influence on a Korean Peninsula that's unified according to uh, the kinds of liberal democratic ideals? Uh, you know, will American forces still be stationed in a unified Korea? China right now, I think, is too uh, preoccupied with these kinds of worries uh, to f uh, favor or support uh, a unified Korea. But, you know, in this sense, they're not, I, I don't think there's that much enthusiasm for quick, for, for rapid reunification in South Korea or the U.S. right now either. So they're, they're not alone in this. Um, I'm Jonathan Ward from Oxford University. Um, I have a question for Dr. Brzezinski. Um, you mentioned that in 1972 to 92, um, that China was able to work with both North and South Korea, and that the North Koreans didn't really have any leverage over the Chinese. Um, it sort of reminds me of what happened uh, between the United States and India after the Sino-Indian border war in 1962, where there was a, a great sort of rapprochement between India and the United States, but then um, that sort of fell apart. One of the significant reasons was because the United States could not deal with Pakistan and India at the same time. 
and the Pakistanis were able to go to the Chinese for support and thereby have leverage um, over the United States. So I'm wondering, um, you know, between 72 and, you know, at least for a decade, um, you would think that the North Koreans could have gone to the Soviet Union to do the same sort of thing and have that support and thereby put pressure on the Chinese. I'm wondering if they did that, why, um, you know, if they didn't, why that was unsuccessful? And also, um, let me see, what did the Chinese do in order to limit that sort of leverage that the North Koreans could have um, hypothetically had? Um, one, I, I think Sergei Rachenko's essay in this volume uh, addresses some of these questions uh, brilliantly. Uh, one of the things is that the Chinese were fortunate that the Soviets were so unskilled uh, in terms of their diplomacy towards uh, North Korea. Uh, when, you know, almost every key thing, uh, participation in the 1988 Olympics, expansion of ties with South Korea, normalization with South Korea, Moscow does it first, and they do it in a way that completely alienates North Korea. And so China did all of these things more carefully. And, uh, you know, that's, that's definitely an area where I, I tend to be respectful of Chinese, uh, Chinese diplomacy during this period. North Korea does uh, try to sort of play the two off against each other. Uh, that's always been its, its strategy. But, you know, this is also in a context of, um, you know, I, I, I think by the time you get to the 1980s, you also have a weakening Soviet economy, diminishing Soviet interest in providing economic and, and military aid. So North Korea is, a, and, and also Soviet, you know, periods of detente between uh, the Soviets uh, and the United States during the Nixon administration and then uh, towards the end of the Reagan administration. So, you know, North Korea has quite a lot to contend with. And it's much more difficult for it to pursue its strategy of balancing the two communist giants ag off against each other than it, 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 than it was during the 1950s and 1960s when it was getting uh, massive amounts of aid uh, from both countries. Will Amatruda, uh, following up on the remark that was made about the U.S. desire to avoid entrapment uh, in, in another war on the Korean uh, uh, Peninsula, uh, I have seen the assertion that U.S. military policy was always concerned with keeping the uh, South Korean Air Force smaller than the North Korean Air Force so as to avoid any temptation by a South Korean government to try to uh, unify the uh, peninsula uh, by, by, by force. Does that fit the facts? Um, and second, with regard to uh, differing perceptions of of their national interests between Washington and Seoul. Uh, how uh, uh, could, would anyone like to comment on uh, South Korean participation in, in the Vietnam War? How reluctant uh, a participant were there? And, and what kind of, of discords did that cause behind the scenes uh, between Washington and Seoul? Um, the spe I haven't seen anything specifically on that first point about the South Korean Air Force. It wouldn't surprise me if it's true. Uh, but of course, in, in, in 57, the United States introduced nukes to the peninsula. Uh, the, the South Koreans kind of expected that they would have joint control with the Americans. <laughs> well, that was a pipe dream. Um, but. Um, I, I think that, I mean, from what I've seen, I mean, the Americans in the 50s uh, are concerned about the size of the ROC Army. The ROC Army, uh, Re wants to keep it, you know, well over 600,000 troops, and we, we see that as a, a definite negative factor in terms of the South Korean economy. And so we're trying to get the South Koreans, not because we're afraid they're going to attack the North, but we're trying to get them to draw down somewhat in their army. And uh, 
at the same time, we realize that we can't possibly expect to influence them in that direction uh, if we draw down on our troops further. So I think the, the introduction of the nuclear weapons is, is uh, to a considerable extent, designed to, to um, uh, well, to compensate for the fact that the North Korean Air Force is clearly stronger than the South Korean Air Force and, and concern along those lines. Uh, but that, that um, uh, you know, the, the presence of the American forces there, too, is, is very much to deter the North Koreans and the Chinese, but it's also to some extent designed to deter the ROK. As long as we have major forces there, we can expect to keep the UN command under our control and keep the ROC forces within the UN command, and that's absolutely crucial. If we draw down too much, ultimately, the fear is we'll lose control of the ROC forces. Uh, could I add a comment? Mm -hmm. um, you know, this, this theme of one partner not really being fully trusting of the other uh, is woven throughout the chapters. It's, uh, and I find it kind of fascinating. I mean, the, the U.S.-Japan case, for example, um, you know, the United States has had bases in Japan for decades um, in the name of defending Japan. The bases have been there to prevent Japan from uh, launching any militaristic activity. They've really been directed at uh, Soviet Union, China, North Korea, and all the rest. And all, the, all along, the United States is saying these bases are really here to protect Japan. Um, there are uh, examples in the, uh, the chapters of South Korea being very uh, hard line on responses to incidents involving really the United States and not South Korea in order to uh, gain concessions on such issues as command and all the rest. And of course, Japan's always been concerned about being pulled into a conflict that somebody else starts. And in the Vietnam case, um, while there weren't any suggestions that Japan might send troops, allied support by South Korea caused consternation that it would uh, result in uh, more pressure on the Japanese government to do something in material sense, you know, provide uh, material support and all that, and ignore the fact that, again, Japanese bases were being used for uh, military activities in Japan. So this theme is, is there, and it's, um, you know, brings up that, you know, the old phrase, uh, with friends like these, um, it, but it, it's, a, it's a fascinating topic, and I think it's um, perhaps not going to be as dramatic in the future, but, uh, but that is an element that we've got to deal with because there are conflicting interests, priorities, and all the rest, and I don't, I don't think they're going to go away. So, but it's a great point. Yeah. Anyone else? Okay, well, I think we'll bring this part of the discussion to a close now. We have a reception outside, and we continue talking. I thank everyone for coming. I'd like to thank the Wilson Center and the uh, Cold War National History Project and the Korea International Documentation Project for hosting this, and thank you very much.